Chapter Seven of Mental Efficiency. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Mental Efficiency and Other Hints to Men and Women by Arnold Bennett. Chapter Seven. Success. Candid Remarks. There are times when the whole free and enlightened press of the United Kingdom seems to become strangely interested in the subject of success, of getting on in life. We are passing through such a period now. It would be difficult to name the prominent journalists who have not lately written, in some form or another, about success. Most singular phenomenon of all, Dr. Emil Reich, has left Plato, Duchesses, and Claridge's Hotel, in order to instruct the million readers of a morning paper in the principles of success. What the million readers thought of the doctor's stirring and strenuous sentences I will not imagine, but I know what I thought, as a plain man. After taking due cognizance of his airy play with the constants and variables of success, after watching him treat energetics, his wonderful new name for the science of success, as though, because he had made it end in ix, it resembled mathematics, I thought that the sublime and venerable art of mystification could no further go. If my fellow pilgrim through this vale of woe, the average young man who arrives at Waterloo at nine-forty every morning with a cigarette in his mouth and a second-class season over his heart, and vague aspirations in his soul— was half as mystified as I was, he has probably ere this decided that the science of success has all the disadvantages of algebra without any of the advantages of cricket, and that he may as well leave it alone, lest evil should befall him. On the off chance that he has come as yet to no decision about the science of success, I am determined to deal with the subject in a disturbingly candid manner. I feel that it is as dangerous to tell the truth about success as it is to tell the truth about the United States. But being thoroughly accustomed to the whistle of bullets round my head, I will nevertheless try. Most writers on success are, through sheer goodness of heart, wickedly disingenuous. For the basis of their argument is that nearly any one who gives his mind to it can achieve success. This is, to put it briefly, untrue. The very central idea of success is separation from the multitude of plain men. It is perhaps the only idea common to all the various sorts of success, differentiation from the crowd. To address the population at large, and tell it how to separate itself from itself, is merely silly. I am now, of course, using the word success in its ordinary sense. If human nature were more perfect than it is, success in life would mean an intimate knowledge of oneself, and the achievement of a philosophic inward calm, and such a goal might well be reached by the majority of mortals. But to us success signifies something else. It may be divided into four branches. 1. Distinction in pure or applied science. This is the least gross of all forms of success as we regard it, for it frequently implies poverty, and it does not by any means always imply fame. 2. Distinction in the arts. Fame and adulation are usually implied in this, though they do not commonly bring riches with them. 3. Direct influence and power over the material lives of other men, that is to say, distinction in politics, national or local. 4. Success in amassing money. This last is the commonest and easiest. Most forms of success will fall under one of these heads. Are they possible to that renowned and much flattered person, the man in the street? They are not, and well you know it, all you professors of the science of success. Only a small minority of us can even become rich. Happily, 
while it is true that success in its common acceptation is by its very essence impossible to the majority there is an accompanying truth which adjusts the balance to wit that the majority do not desire success this may seem a bold saying but it is in accordance with the facts conceive the man in the street suddenly by some miracle invested with political power and of course under the obligation to use it he would be so upset worried wearied and exasperated at the end of a week that he would be ready to give the eyes out of his head in order to get rid of it as for success in science or in art the average person's interest in such matters is so slight compared with that of the man of science or the artist that he cannot be said to have an interest in them and supposing that distinction in them were thrust upon him he would rapidly lose that distinction by simple indifference and neglect the average person certainly wants some money and the average person does not usually rest until he has got as much as is needed for the satisfaction of his instinctive needs he will move the heaven and earth of his environment to earn sufficient money for marriage in the station to which he has been accustomed and precisely at that point his genuine desire for money will cease to be active the average man has this in common with the most exceptional genius that his career in its main contours is governed by his instincts the average man flourishes and finds his ease in an atmosphere of peaceful routine men destined for success flourish and find their ease in an atmosphere of collision and disturbance the two temperaments are diverse naturally the average man dreams vaguely upon occasion he dreams how nice it would be to be famous and rich we all dream vaguely upon such things but to dream vaguely is not to desire i often tell myself that i would give anything to be the equal of cinque valli the juggler or to be the captain of the largest atlantic liner but the reflective part of me tells me that my yearning to emulate these astonishing personages is not a genuine desire and that its realization would not increase my happiness to obtain a passably true notion of what happens to the mass of mankind in its progress from the cradle to the grave one must not attempt to survey a whole nation nor even a great metropolis nor even a very big city like manchester or liverpool these panoramas are so immense and confusing that they defeat the observing eye it is better to take a small town of say twenty or thirty thousand inhabitants such a town as most of us know more or less intimately the extremely few individuals whose instincts mark them out to take part in the struggle for success can be identified at once for the first thing they do is to leave the town the air of the town is not bracing enough for them their nostrils dilate for something keener those who are left form a microcosm which is representative enough of the world at large between the ages of thirty and forty they begin to sort themselves out in their own sphere they take their places a dozen or so politicians form the town council and rule the town half a dozen businessmen stand for the town's commercial activity and its wealth a few others teach science and art or are locally known as botanists geologists amateurs of music or amateurs of some other art these are the distinguished and it will be perceived that they cannot be more numerous than they are what of the rest have they struggled for success and been beaten not they do they as they grow old resemble disappointed men not they they have fulfilled themselves modestly they have got what they genuinely tried to get they have never even gone near the outskirts of the battle for success but they have not failed the number of failures is surprisingly small you see a shabby disappointed aging man flit down the main street 
and someone replies to your inquiry, that so-and-so, one of life's failures, poor fellow. And the very tone in which the words are uttered proves the excessive rarity of the real failure. It goes without saying that the case of the handful who have left the town in search of the success with the capital S has a tremendous interest of curiosity for the mass who remain. I will consider it. THE SUCCESSFUL AND THE UNSUCCESSFUL Having boldly stated that success is not, and cannot be, within grasp of the majority, I now proceed to state, as regards the minority, that they do not achieve it in the manner in which they are commonly supposed to achieve it. And I may add an expression of my thankfulness that they do not. The popular delusion is that success is attained by what I may call the Benjamin Franklin method. Franklin was a very great man. He united in his character a set of splendid qualities as various in their different ways as those possessed by Leonardo da Vinci. I have an immense admiration for him. But his autobiography does make me angry. His autobiography is understood to be a classic, and if you say a word against it in the United States, you are apt to get killed. I do not, however, contemplate an immediate visit to the United States, and I shall venture to assert that Benjamin Franklin's autobiography is a detestable book, and a misleading book. I can recall only two other volumes which I would more willingly revile. One is Samuel Budgett, the successful merchant, and the other is From Log Cabin to White House, being the history of President Garfield. Such books may impose on boys, and it is conceivable that they do not harm boys. Franklin, by the way, began his autobiography in the form of a letter to his son. But the grown man who can support them without nausea ought to go and see a doctor. For there is something wrong with him. I began now, blandly remarks Franklin, to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town that were lovers of reading, with whom I spent my evenings very pleasantly, in italics, and gained money by my industry and frugality, end of italics. Or again, quote, it was about this time I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. I made a little book in which I allotted a page for each of the virtues. I ruled each page with red ink, so as to have seven columns, one for each day of the week. I crossed these columns with thirteen red lines, marking the beginning of each line with the first letter of one of the virtues, on which line, and in its proper column, I might mark, by a little black spot, every fault I found upon examination to have been committed respecting that virtue upon that day. End quote. Shade of Franklin, where'er thou art, this is really a little bit stiff. A man may be excused even such infamies of priggishness, but truly he ought not to go and write them down, especially to his son. And why the detail about red ink? If Franklin's son was not driven to evil courses by the perusal of that monstrous autobiography, he must have been a man almost as astounding as his father. Now, Franklin could only have written his immortal classic from one of three motives. One sheer conceit. He was a prig, but he was not conceited. Two, a desire that others should profit by his mistakes. He never made any mistakes. Now and again he emphasises some trifling error, but that is only his fun. Three, a desire that others should profit by the recital of his virtuous sagacity to reach a similar success. The last was undoubtedly his principal motive. Honest fellow who happened to be a genius. But the point is that his success was in no way the result of his virtuous sagacity, 
I would go further and say that his dreadful virtuous sagacity often hindered his success. No one is a worse guide to success than your typical successful man. He seldom understands the reasons of his own success, and when he is asked by a popular magazine to give his experiences for the benefit of the use of a whole nation, it is impossible for him to be natural and sincere. He knows the kind of thing that is expected from him, and if he didn't come to London with half a crown in his pocket, he probably did something equally silly, and he puts that down, and the note of the article or interview is struck, and good-bye to genuine truth. There recently appeared in a daily paper an autobiographic didactic article by one of the world's richest men which was the most inadequate article of the sort that I have ever come across. Successful men forget so much of their lives. Moreover, nothing is easier than to explain an accomplished fact in a nice, agreeable, conventional way. The entire business of success is a gigantic, tacit conspiracy on the part of the minority to deceive the majority. Are successful men more industrious, frugal, and intelligent than men who are not successful? I maintain that they are not, and I have studied successful men at close quarters. One of the commonest characteristics of the successful man is his idleness, his immense capacity for wasting time. I stoutly assert that, as a rule, successful men are by habit comparatively idle. As for frugality, it is practically unknown among the successful classes. This statement applies with particular force to financiers. As for intelligence, I have over and over again been startled by the lack of intelligence in successful men. They are, indeed, capable of stupidities that would be the ruin of a plain clerk. And much of the talk in those circles which surround the successful man is devoted to the enumeration of instances of his lack of intelligence. Another point. Successful men seldom succeed as the result of an ordered arrangement of their lives. They are the least methodical of creatures. Naturally, when they have arrived, they amuse themselves and impress the majority by being convinced that right from the start, with a steady eye on the goal, they had carefully planned every foot of the route. No. Great success never depends on the practice of the humbler virtues, though it may occasionally depend on the practice of the prouder vices. Use industry, frugality, and common sense by all means, but do not expect that they will help you to success, because they will not. I shall no doubt be told that what I have just written has an immoral tendency, and is a direct encouragement to sloth, thriftlessness, etc. One of our chief national faults is our hypocritical desire to suppress the truth on the pretext that to admit it would encourage sin, whereas the real explanation is that we are afraid of the truth. I will not be guilty of that fault. I do like to look a fact in the face without blinking. I am fully persuaded that, per head, there is more of the virtues in the unsuccessful majority than in the successful minority. In London alone are there not hundreds of miles of streets crammed with industry, frugality, and prudence? Some of the most brilliant men I have known have been failures, and not through lack of character either. And some of the least gifted have been marvellously successful. It is impossible to point to a single branch of human activity in which success can be explained by the conventional principles that find general acceptance. I hear you, O oh reader, murmuring to yourself, this is all very well, but he is simply being paradoxical for his own diversion. I would that I could persuade you of my intense seriousness. I have endeavoured to show what does not make success, 
I will next endeavour to show what does make it, but my hope is forlorn. THE INWARDNESS OF SUCCESS Of course, one can no more explain success than one can explain Beethoven's C minor symphony. One may state what key it is written in, and make expert reflections upon its form, and catalogue its themes, and relate it to symphonies that preceded it, and symphonies that followed it. But in the end, one is reduced to saying that the C minor symphony is beautiful, because it is. In the same manner, one is reduced to saying that the sole real difference between success and failure is that success succeeds. This being frankly admitted at the outset, I will allow myself to assert that there are three sorts of success. Success A is the accidental sort. It is due to the thing we call chance, and to nothing else. We are all of us still very superstitious, and the caprices of chance have a singular effect upon us. Suppose that I go to Monte Carlo, and announce to a friend my firm conviction that red will turn up next time, and I back red for the maximum, and red does turn up. My friend, in spite of his intellect, will vaguely attribute to me a mysterious power, yet chance alone would be responsible. If I did that six times running, all the players at the table would be interested in me. If I did it a dozen times, all the players in the casino would regard me with awe. Yet chance alone would be responsible. If I did it eighteen times, my name would be in every newspaper in Europe. Yet chance alone would be responsible. I should be, in that department of human activity, an extremely successful man, and the vast majority of people would instinctively credit me with gifts that I do not possess. If such phenomena of superstition can occur in an affair where the agency of chance is open and avowed, how much more probable is it that people should refuse to be satisfied with the explanation of sheer accident in affairs where it is to the interest of the principal actors to conceal the role played by chance? Nevertheless, there can be no doubt in the minds of persons who have viewed success at close quarters that a proportion of it is due solely and utterly to chance. Successful men flourish to-day, and have flourished in the past, who have no quality whatever to differentiate them from the multitude. Red has turned up for them a sufficient number of times, and the universal superstitious instinct not to believe in chance has accordingly surrounded them with a halo. It is merely ridiculous to say, as some do say, that success is never due to chance alone, because nearly everybody is personally acquainted with reasonable proof, on a great or a small scale, to the contrary. The second sort of success, B, is that made by men who, while not gifted with first-class talents, have, beyond doubt, the talent to succeed. I should describe these men by saying that, though they deserve something, they do not deserve the dazzling reward known as success. They strike us as overpaid. We meet them in all professions and trades, and we do not really respect them. They excite our curiosity, and perhaps our envy. They may rise very high indeed, but they must always be unpleasantly conscious of a serious reservation in our attitude towards them and if they could read their obituary notices, they would assuredly discern therein a certain chilliness, however kindly we acted up to our great national motto of De Mortuis Nil Nist Bunkum. It is this class of success which puzzles the social student. How comes it that men without any other talent possess a mysterious and indefinable talent to succeed? Well, it seems to me that such men always display certain characteristics, and the chief of these characteristics is the continual insatiable wish to succeed. They are preoccupied with the idea of succeeding. 
we others are not so preoccupied. We dream of success at intervals, but we have not the passion for success. We don't lie awake at nights pondering upon it. The second characteristic of these men springs naturally from the first. They are always on the lookout. This does not mean that they are industrious. I stated in a previous article my belief that, as a rule, successful men are not particularly industrious. A man on a raft with his shirt for a signal cannot be termed industrious, but he will keep his eyes open for a sail on the horizon. If he simply lies down and goes to sleep, he may miss the chance of his life in a very special sense. The man with the talent to succeed is the man on the raft who never goes to sleep. His indefatigable orb sweeps the main from sunset to sunset. Having sighted a sail, he gets up on his hind legs and waves that shirt in so determined a manner that the ship is bound to see him and take him off. Occasionally he plunges into the sea, risking sharks and other perils. If he doesn't get there, we hear nothing of him. If he does, some person will ultimately multiply by ten the number of sharks that he braved. That person is called a biographer. Let me drop the metaphor. Another characteristic of these men is that they seem to have the exact contrary of what is known as common sense. They will become enamoured of some enterprise which infallibly impresses the average common-sense person as a mad and hopeless enterprise. The average common-sense person will demolish the hopes of that enterprise by incontrovertible argument. He will point out that it is foolish on the face of it, that it has never been attempted before, and that it responds to no need of humanity. He will say to himself, This fellow with his precious enterprise has a twist in his brain. He can't reply to my arguments, and yet he obstinately persists in going on. And the man destined to success does go on. Perhaps the enterprise fails. It often fails. And then the average common-sense person expends much breath in I told you so's. But the man continues to be on the lookout. His thirst is unassuaged. His taste for enterprises foredoomed to failure is incurable. And one day some enterprise foredoomed to failure develops into a success. We all hear of it. We all open our mouths and gape. Of the failures we have heard nothing. Once the man has achieved success, the thing becomes a habit with him. The difference between a success and a failure is often so slight that a reputation for succeeding will ensure success and a reputation for failing will ensure failure. Chance plays an important part in such careers, but not a paramount part. One can only say that it is more useful to have luck at the beginning than later on. These men of success generally have pliable temperaments. They are not frequently unmoral, but they regard a conscience as a good servant and a bad master. They live in an atmosphere of compromise. There remains class C of success, the class of sheer high merit. I am not a pessimist, nor am I an optimist. I try to arrive at the truth, and I should say that in putting success C at ten per cent of the sum total of all successes, I am being generous to class C. Not that I believe that vast quantities of merit go unappreciated. My reason for giving to Class C only a modest share is the fact that there is so little sheer high merit. And does it not stand to reason that high merit must be very exceptional? This sort of success needs no explanation, no accounting for. It is the justification of our singular belief in the principle of the triumph of justice. And it is among natural phenomena perhaps the only justification that can be advanced for that belief. 
and certainly, when we behold the spectacle of genuine, distinguished merit gaining, without undue delay, and without the sacrifice of dignity or of conscience, the applause of the kind-hearted but obtuse and insensible majority of the human race, we have fair reason to hug ourselves. End of chapter 7